Claire and today I'm going to show you how to make a textile postcard. Holidays aren't quite what we expected this year and we're not all jetting off to exotic destinations. Not to worry, we can get some inspiration closer to home. So how about creating a postcard that says greetings from your garden? I'm going to show you how to make one of these. You can see it's stamped on the back. So there's a bit of painting, a bit of bonding, lots of machine embroidery and I'm going to take you through every step so that you can actually get some inspiration and create beautiful postcards to be sending home to your family and friends. So to make your background for your postcard I've used medium weight calico so I've just cut myself a square here which is 12 inches square because I'm actually going to put a 10 inch hoop on it uh, and that, that fits quite nicely. It means you've got plenty of space to actually stitch your postcard. So that, that that's a good size. And uh, you may ask what size postcard you use. Well, I think for this what I did, I actually drew around an existing postcard, but the measurements of this happen to be four and a half inches by six and three quarters, which is about 11 and a half centimetres by 17 centimetres. But you can make your postcard whatever size you want, really. So what I start by doing is actually placing my cardboard template, or you can just draw around uh, the outline, and I actually mask off with masking tape because I'm going to paint my background and I just don't want it to, to bleed over the rest of the calico. So the best thing to do is just to use masking tape and mark the edges. So that's what I'm doing. Oops. And just do the other side. There we go. Just find this is quite a quick way of doing things. You can press the masking tape down properly once you've removed your template, but uh, if you just do this, there we go. Remove your template and then you can actually just press that down fully and you're ready for the next stage which is the painting stage. So you might want to know what kind of paint I'm using. I'm actually just using fabric paint but if you've got acrylic paint that would be absolutely fine. I don't want you to think that you've got to go out and buy a load of special bits and pieces. I just want you to be able to use up bits you've got at home and this is a great way of doing it. So the first thing I tend to do is to pop uh, something underneath the calico just to stop the paint from penetrating the surface that you're working on. So a scrap bit of paper is fine. You're not going to be painting it very heavily but uh, usually something goes through so that's what I would do. Just pop a bit of fabric uh, paper underneath and let's use some paint. Well I'm using some fabric paint and as I say I just happen to have these and I'm just going to use a little lid and pop some colours in there. And just using a couple of colours. And just water it down quite a lot. Just really want to give it a bit of a wash. I don't want to be painting it too thickly because that's not the look I want and also when you're sewing you don't ever really want to have too thick paint because sometimes that can cause problems when you're stitching so make it nice and watered down and then just do a light wash over really it's as simple as that just make sure Just nice. Could use a bigger brush actually. I think I've got one here. Otherwise, I'd be here all day. <laughs> so I just and I wouldn't be too precise with this. Just sort of slop it on. Oops. If you get a 
a bit like that that you think oh actually I don't I don't want that you can obviously just get the the brush and water it down a bit more but uh, doesn't matter little bits of calico show but I'm trying to give it a, a wash all over different shades of green. Quite like that mottled, mottled effect. And then what you want to do is leave that to dry and then we're going to actually just put a little bit of stamped paint on it just to, to break up the texture really. But uh, do that first and then leave it to dry. Once your piece is dry, what I do is then get uh, a decorative sponge. I know it was all the rage to use these kind of sponges in, in decorating. I think it was sort of 80s and 90s. But if you've got a textured sponge or, or something similar, what I then do is just put a little bit of paint on there. Again, I'm using fabric paint, but of course you can use acrylic. It's not as if we're washing this item. And then I would just put a little bit of texture on here just by sponging it a little bit. Of course you could perhaps um, paint bubble wrap and just stamp on there. We just want a little bit of irregular colour on there. So something like that's absolutely fine. You can see I've left the masking tape on there. It gives it its nice sharp edge and you can then leave that to dry or um, if you like you can just peel it off. And once that's actually dry give it an iron and you're ready then to actually be doing the flowers, the flowers of your garden. So if you're impatient you can always give it a quick blow dry with a hairdryer but uh, we're ready for the next stage. So the calico is all dry now and I've given it an iron and what I've also done is marked five millimetres in from the edge and I've done that on all four sides and rather than draw a solid pencil line I've actually just done a dotted line and the reason for that is when we stitch our postcard sides together we don't want to actually be stitching over any embroidery so by drawing the line when I work out my composition and where I'm going to put my flowers etc I'll know to to give a, a gap or leave a gap near the edge so once you've done that, you need to pop it in a hoop. And as I say, I'm going to use a 12, uh, sorry, a 10 inch hoop, one of these good old fashioned ones. And all you need to do is slacken that outer screw, remove the inner hoop, and then just pop your calico over the top of the outer hoop and just position that so that you've got plenty of space all the way around so that when you stitch you can access all areas of your postcard. Pop your inner hoop in and it's a good idea to do this on a table so that you can get it nice and firm. So just pop that in, push that down okay and then what I tend to do is hold on to the hoop and pull the calico at right angles that way your inner hoop doesn't flip out so just pull that nice and tightly and then once you've gone all the way around tighten that screw now if it's a bit tough get a good old screwdriver on it I think I'm just about there actually so just make sure that's nice and tight which it is a little wrinkle there so just pull that up because that then gives you this nice taut canvas enabling you to stitch really easily so because it is only a medium weight calico you would find it quite tricky to put that under the machine and have control but by putting it in a hoop it's brilliant it's all nice and tight ready for some machine embroidery right so we're ready to do a little bit of machine embroidery 
So I have set my machine up by lowering the feed dogs. I've popped a open-toed machine embroidery foot on. This is a, on a Benina, so it's foot number 24. My needle is a size 80, just a universal 80, which is perfectly all right for sewing through a single thickness of calico and anything else that we put on top. And then the thread that I'm using, I'm using Madeira, Madeira rayon thread, and I'm using a variegated thread on the top. So the colour is 2031 and it's a lovely variegated green. Uh, and then in the bobbin, I've actually just got a plain green uh, rayon thread. So they're my threads. I know people also want to know about tension and things like that. Machines vary. A lot of modern machines, you don't need to tweak the tension too much. Older machines, you sometimes do. It's I can't give you a setting that will work universally, so the best thing to do is have a little practice on your own machine. But a good rule of thumb is, you know, put a, a new needle in and have the same weight of thread, top and bottom, whatever it is that you use. If you're using cotton, have it top and bottom, polyester, top and bottom. The, the only time that I contradict myself is when I use a rayon thread on the top and then I'll use a bobbin fill which is usually made of polyester but because it bobbin fill is much much finer thread there isn't that problem of, of pulling through but if for example you can see your bobbin thread coming through your top tension may need to be slackened so that's just a rule of thumb but I've not tweaked the tension with this machine and I'm ready to go so I'm going to put some texture in and you're probably thinking, oh, what's all this? Uh, this is some lovely wool that one of my dear friends actually dyes. She owns some Winsleydales. So that's what gives it this lovely, it's beautiful curly coat. And I just love using it in my work. But if you've got some merino wool or some other texture, uh, I'm just going to couch it down. I think it works quite well on the postcard. So use whatever you've got and what you need to do, of course, is to bring up your bobbin thread before you start. So I'm just doing that. Pop your needle back in and then you're ready to go. And just keep your fingers out of the way. Now, what I've done with this machine is I've set it to a zigzag because we can get some really interesting effects with zigzag. So I realise when you use zigzag in a conventional way, towards you if you move your hoop slowly and there we are you can see it's quite an open zigzag if I was to go faster with my foot and not move my hoop you get a satin stitch so that's all very well now what you do need to be careful about is that you don't get yourself caught up in all the texture that you're couching down. So you can snip your end off once you've started. We'll be going over where we've started, so it's not gonna come unraveled. Uh, and we're just gonna couch it down. So, oops, I haven't pinned it. I find it easier just to sort of hold it in place. Oops, she says. Uh, here we go. And as well as using zigzag in the conventional way, let me just lift my foot up a moment. There we go, just make sure that that's under there. And you see, it's very easy to get a bit close to the edge, so just be mindful of that, and that pencil line will come in handy. So I'm just going to couch this down in a, in a sort of haphazard way. And as I say, as well as using zigzag in a conventional way, if you go from side to side, you get some really interesting effects. So gently, gently to begin with, because this stuff is a little bit uncontrollable. If you do get it wrapped around the foot, which I have done there, you can manoeuvre yourself out or just cut it. It's not the end of the world if you cut it. So I'm just going to a bit of a zigzag. There we go. So you can actually see you're getting some interesting effects. 
might just do a little bit more of that. really nice having a variegated thread because it's it's changing so it's just a bit of texture it's just a bit of background we'll work out the composition of the flowers once we've all got this in place and it's quite nice to have some lumpy bits because that's going to create the interest we will be doing some more stitching over this but to begin with just catching it down so I'm quite happy with that I'm going to stop there so if I just cut that cut. just want to get the focus right there we go I'll just show you what I've done just gives it a bit of texture. So here we are, you can have a little look and see what I've done. It's really quite haphazard. And you, you could see I just uh, doodled away really, but that's going to be great. We can work from that and now I'm ready to draw my flowers. As well as drawing onto the calico, what you can also do to create your flowers is to add some fabric. So my hydrangea is actually made using a piece of silk. So the best way to add that to your work is by getting a piece of bond web. I've just cut a little square here. And when you feel the bond web, it's the rough side, which is the sticky, which you need to have facing your fabric. Um, what I always get in the habit of doing is always having a piece of baking parchment handy. Uh, and I always put that in between my work and the iron because no matter how many years you've been doing this, we all make mistakes and we can easily, especially when we're in a hurry, put the thing upside down. So uh, what I'm going to do, this is a nice medium weight piece of Dupion silk, but it could be any bit of fabric. It could be patterns. It could actually have some flowers on it. That would be quite nice. But anyway, place that rough side down onto your silk. And even though that's got the paper backing, I do actually like to put a piece of baking parchment over the top and using a dry iron give it a firm wiggle and off okay now i kind of drew my rough outline on there so the thing to do before you merrily peel it off is to waft it about a bit to let it cool and i've drawn my design but what we also need to do is just peel up a corner and that will help you peel it off in a minute. So, and you and you could hear and see that that peeled off quite nicely. And so I know that that's been ironed on properly. So what I would then do is using paper scissors because we've got the paper backing. Uh, they are quite sharp paper scissors. I would actually cut through both the fabric and the paper. And I'm just cutting an outline, a rough outline of my hydrangea. I mean, I've gone around the garden and looked at these things and scrutinised shapes and given myself some ideas. And we've all been busy in our gardens during this time, so I'm sure you'll have plenty of inspiration to hand. And because I peeled that off earlier, it's all there, ready. And so now, if I place that on my piece of work... That can be ironed. Now the hoop is actually going to get in the way of me giving it a good old iron so I will take it out of the hoop and even though we've got that fabric there again call me paranoid I just still tend to put a piece of baking parchment over the top and give that a firm iron and that's nice and stuck. And then what you can also see on here are some drawn flowers and bits and pieces. So I'll show you what else you can do to create your flowers. So here's the postcard. And you can see all the details. You've got some 
lavender over on the left, a bit of cow parsley, cornflowers, echinacea, there's my hydrangea in the corner, and there's some ivy leaves as well. And you can see the texture with a few fronds and leaves and different grasses growing up there. But just take some inspiration from your own garden and be as creative as you can. It's a good idea to have a little bit of a practice. This is a practice piece of calico. You can play with the kinds of threads that you want to use. My echinacea on the top left, I wasn't too sure about the metallic thread on it and I didn't like it in this sample, but in the finished thing I used a different one. And the ivy leaves. Yeah, just go and pick them from the garden and you can actually literally sew around them. But have a little play and a little scribble. It's all good practice. So on the sample here, you can see that I've drawn some flowers and you can see that I've actually got my hydrangea in the corner ready to stitch. I like to use water-soluble pencils. So what you can do is actually put some colour in the petals. Uh, I think I'll use actual more blue. Just put a bit in, be a bit scratchy with it. A bit more of a purpley one. And then just using a paintbrush dipped in water. can actually just paint it. That just gives it quite a nice effect. Now these are just ordinary water soluble pencils. I appreciate that there are some ones out there that are a bit more permanent but the fact that this is just a postcard, it's not actually going on a garment and being laundered, it'll be absolutely fine for fixing. So just blend those bits together I think that just gives it a nice effect. And then all we need to do is actually stitch over it to give it a bit of definition. I've done all the painting on the piece, so I'm just going to do some outlining now. So I've just got a black rayon thread, top and bottom, and starting in the corner, one of the petals, just bring up your bobbin thread and just go around the edge. Now, it's always a good idea if you actually rotate your work so that you can see where you're going you're more likely to actually go around the edge neatly so just oops, go towards you and of course because we're free machine embroidery we can go in any direction now I know there's the expression fast foot slow hand what I will say though is that when you're being so slow when you're moving your hoop because you're being quite precise going around these outlines you can probably hear that my foot has slowed down so yes my foot is faster than my hoop but I am going quite slowly because I actually just want to make sure that I'm going where I want to go so I'll just get some of that greenery out of the way and I'm just going to go around these petals once I think that's enough really being black anyway it's going to stand out and that's the definition that I want so towards you and then go backwards stop turn my work around it doesn't matter if you're not exactly precise but you know you've got to stand a good chance of going where you want to if you turn your work around you don't have to use black thread of course you could do a, a, a more subtle postcard with with blue or whatever flower I mean you use whatever thread you fancy I'm just giving you some ideas so I'm just going to cut those threads as I say once you've you've started you can cut those off it's not going to come undone because we're going to go and do some stitching back over there so um, a little bit of jaggedy edge just to sort of Create that corn flowery effect. Just go up and down a little bit, give it a bit of definition. And that outside edge is a bit higgledy piggledy. And then to do a stem, work out where you want to come down 
and make sure you put the greener in the right place. And I'm actually just going to come down like that. And oops, I've got caught. I'm thinking, why can't I'm aren't I moving? Well, that's good. I've got caught on that greenery. So just untuck yourself, uh, and then go go backwards. And just sort of make it a bit fatter at the top there. There we are. That's the corn flour done. Oops. Just attached again, aren't I? There we are. Let's just cut that. And I'm going to do that to the other corn flour and some of the other flowers. And I'll show you when I've done all that sewing. One way of doing a leaf is to start at the base of the leaf. Bring up your bobbin thread, pop your needle back in and just sew the outline and then to sew the vein go right down the middle to the tip and then on the way back actually do the veining. My hydrangea is done by starting in the middle and drawing, or oh, stitching rather, all those little flowers. So bring your bobbin thread up and starting sort of in the centre of the flower, do these small little flowers that are shaped like this. So again then turn your piece of work round for another one, turn your work round, cut those ends off so they don't get trapped. So again another little flower petal. So you're doing, the flowers have four petals and then what you need to do is just make your way around the piece of fabric until you've actually got a hydrangea. So the way that I've done this seed head is I've sewn in black thread right to the end and then I've just actually just wiggled from side to side, a bit of a scribble really, and that's actually just made the, the end bit. And I've just gone down, you can just make it a bit wider there, and then stitch the bottom. Parsley is stitched in a similar way, but this time just do some little wiggles back down that stem and back out to the next one, and just some little wiggles. So turn your work around so you can see where you're going. Come towards you, little wiggles. I'm barely moving my hoop and that's what's giving me that control and I have slowed my foot down accordingly. Wiggle about a little bit at the base because that's just a bit wider, and then sew. Oh, my cornflower's in the way, just sew around the edge of the cornflower. Oops. There we go, and that's the cow parsley. The leaves can actually be stitched differently. So this ivy leaf, I'm actually sewing from side to side in green thread. I'm quite dense with it. And then 
that's an angle to the other half of that part of that leaf, if that makes sense. And then the next bit you could do in different sections. So again, I'll sew from side to side. do we'll sew the veins of the ivy in another colour. There we are, I've got quite a nicely stitched ivy leaf with the uh, the grain sort of in different different directions so it makes it quite interesting. What we can then do are some artistic curls. I know ivy leaves don't really have curls but you can sort of have a bit of a creeper effect and a little bit of a curl and then just go back over yourself there and likewise up here do a little curl and then go back over yourself just with a little bit of artistic license and again this ivy come down from there sort of tendrils and very artistic so whilst I've still got green thread in the machine I'm actually going to do some grasses and different foliage now here so you can see where you've got some gaps so you can really go to town just do some simple straight lines of grasses just build up your ground a bit move along and do some more forms up here. Oops, got caught up again, so just watch watch that green stuff. You do get caught up on it if you're not careful better when it's got a few more stitches in it. As I say, if you do just become a little bit too tangled up, you can always just trim it. kinds of leaves and fondy bits. Stitch similarly to the veins of the leaf earlier, going back over yourself. Just have them wafting gently. labour over this bit too much because otherwise it looks too contrived and grasses and that lot are never that well organised so just just doodle really and a little bit more of this and then 
what I'll do is a little bit more greenery in a, in a different colour, a little bit more stitching in a different colour. I've now changed my thread colour to an ivory and I'm going to do the veins of the ivy. So when you really look at the ivy you actually see that the veins are white so I thought I would actually stitch them in the white. So I've done my dense green and how I start is at the base of the ivy leaf and I just sew a straight line all the way down the middle of the leaf and then I'll do to the tip of the other side and also to the middle. Just cut your ends off before they get trapped. And the design is actually slightly different. It's sort of sort of in these loops. So I'm just going to do one half first and stitch down like that and then up the other side. then it means I can do some white detail there and then over on the other side. There we go. I think that makes it look quite quite nice. The other thing I'm going to do is actually to use some metallic thread on the echinacea. And I know sometimes using a metallic thread can terrify people. They sort of think, oh, it's always going to snap. And they're not quite sure what they need to do. So I just want to give you a little bit of confidence using metallic thread. I've used metallic thread for a lot, long time. And yes, I've had my problems. But I've realised that a lot of it's operator error. So uh, I'm going to show you this really pretty pink metallic thread. I don't know if you can see that. It's gorgeous. It's Madeira and it's got this, it's from the sparkling range so it really does twinkle. So I'm going to pop that in the top of my machine. So I haven't changed my needle. I've still got my universal size 80 needle in there. Now I know some people say well a size 80 doesn't work for me and a lot of people do use a size 90. Either a top stitch needle which has a larger eye or a metallic needle 90 which has a larger iron it also has a groove down the front whoops have I just unthreaded that I have haven't I I'll just do that again more haste less speed there we go so that's all threaded and in my bobbin I haven't got metallic thread I've actually got polyester bobbin fill so that's absolutely fine now the thing with metallic thread is not to go too quickly now as I said before Older machines you probably will have to slacken the tension a little bit but I'm not going to affect the tension on this machine and as long as I don't go too slowly and you actually give the machine chance to stitch then I should be okay with this. So um, let's just pop the needle in and bring the bobbin thread up and I just want to do a little bit of metallic thread just on some of the some of the petals. So I'm just going to just gives it a bit of twinkle really. So there we are, backwards and forwards there, and a little bit down on this side. And I'm not going too quickly. You don't want to go held for leather, because that's when things like snapping occur. But just backwards and forwards. I'm just literally doing a few stitches just to give it a little bit of twinkle. I don't think this piece needs too much metallic thread, but I am rather fond of a metallic thread. And I think once you've used it and you've had a good experience, you'll have the confidence to use it again. And to be honest, when I first started machine embroidering, which I tell you is more years than I care to remember, there were not very many colours on the market. There are a lot more. And like this pink, for example. Gorgeous. Right. So I'm happy with that going to cut and come out and it just gives it a nice little bit of twinkle on that flower so ready really to do some lettering so here we are the design is all complete we're just now ready to 
put some lettering on there. So there's a nice gap here where you can write something like greetings from the garden, which is what I did on this one. And what I did with that was to practice writing on a bit of paper. When I was happy with what I wanted to say, I wrote it down and then for ease actually I just leant against a window and traced it through onto the calico and then wrote in black thread, went over it just gently gently. So different ways in which you can mark the lettering, you could use good old-fashioned pencil, there are other markers and vanishing pens that disappear so it's really up to you what you feel like using. Of course people do use the friction pens which disappear with heat but just be cautious because they do come back in the cold however you're going to be such an expert writing over that it doesn't matter if it does come back because you'll have covered it up but anyway have a little practice think of a phrase that's suitable and then you can do your lettering so to create the back of the postcard i've used a rubber stamp I bought it off the internet. All I would say is just be careful when you buy off the internet that you get the right measurements because the first one I bought was a bit small. It wasn't life size. So that's what I've got. And I'm using the same medium weight calico. I've got a piece here that's bigger than the postcard and I'm stamping it with archival ink and that's perfect for using on fabric. So what I try, what I like to do is use the ink pad and stamp my rubber stamp like that. A couple of reasons I do that. It's because it's a large stamp, it's very easy to rock your rubber stamp and actually get ink elsewhere. So hopefully by doing this, I'll eliminate the risk of doing that. Well, that's the plan anyway. So once you've made sure that that's completely covered, turn it over and you don't want to be too close to the corner because don't forget you're going to be zigzagging around your piece of work and I don't want this part of my design to be obliterated so I think that will give me plenty of space around it so if I place that there and give it a firm push down I'm working on a firm surface Oops. so give that a good firm press and there we are and then just put that to one side but that will be the back of your postcard it's great isn't it right I'm just going to talk you through when you've finished sewing your postcard what you do next now there's no lettering on this one but uh, imagine that I have done my lettering if I did want to do any beading that would be when I would attach some beads. I did attach some beads to the hydrangea. But once you've done that, then I'm actually going to make it a stiff postcard by using a Vlieseline product, which is S80. Now that isn't a fusible backing. It is actually a stiffener that you, you have to actually put the bonder web on. But And I know that there are other products which are thicker and do have a fusible backing. So you could perhaps use a thicker product that has that fusible backing on it already. But I'm using what I've already got and I'm quite happy with the results. So this is how you would actually make the postcard stiff and I'll just talk you through it. I didn't think it would be very exciting to watch me doing a load of ironing. So I'm just gonna talk you through the layers. So you would get your postcard the and you're, you're looking at the, the back of it and you would get a piece of bonder web, a little bit bigger than your postcard, place that down, so don't forget it's rough side down, and iron that, okay? And once it's cool, you're able to peel the backing off, and then I would place a layer of my Vlieseline S80, okay? Now what I tend to do with that is I always put a, um, a bit of baking parchment over the top, and then iron that and that will now be attached to that. I then get another piece of bonder web, again rough side down and iron that and then when that's cool peel that off. So what you've actually got is your piece of calico, you've had a layer of bonder web, you've got the 
S80 and then you've got a layer of bonder web on that so that is ready to have something stuck to it. When you've done that I would get my calico with the postcard stamped, turn that over, piece of violin, place that down, iron that, remove the paper backing once cool, place that on top and iron that. And then to finish it off, turn that over. Don't forget that hasn't got any sticky on but that has. So that when you actually place that on top and iron it, it will all stick together. And what you should end up with is something like that. And that's all nice and stiff. Now if you think to yourself, well come on Claire, can't I use just a single layer of that S80? I tried that before on a product because I was a little bit concerned about sewing through it and uh, I just used a single thickness. Now although it works, a uh, couple of things I don't like. It is a bit too flexible for my liking and also you can actually see your design through the calico. So I do think it needs to be either a thicker product or use two layers. So to finish the postcard off we've actually got to zigzag around the outside edge. So I've taken my machine out of free motion embroidery mode, I've got my teeth back up and I've got a foot on my machine that allows me to do zigzag. I've set the zigzag to the same width as my measurement from the edge of the postcard, so that was half a centimetre. And I've also set it so that it's a very close satin stitch. Now it's a good idea just to have a little practice before you launch into your pipe on your postcard. So I've got a bit of a uh, S80, a couple of pieces sandwiched in between some calico so I can have a little practice. So I'm going to line this up and what you want to do is when you do the zigzag, the zigzag needs to go over the edge of the actual postcard. So as I say you can have a little practice so I need to make sure, there we go, that I've lined that edge and I know that the zigzag is going over it. So just letting that feed through gently. Make sure you've got plenty of thread in your bobbin. You don't want to be running out halfway through. I've got viscose rayon, top and bottom, and I've chosen one of the greens that features in the postcard. I realise that lighter part of my uh, postcard is, 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 you know, is a paler green, but uh, I thought I'd go for the dark green all the way around the edge. So we've done that. So let's just have a look and see if that's any good, if that's giving me, me the effect that I want. And yeah, you can see we're nicely over the edge. I'm hoping you can see anyway. So I'm ready to go for the real thing. And it's a good idea because we're going to have a join, is, is not to have a, a join in an obvious place. So your eye is probably naturally drawn to the top right. So I wouldn't start up there. Um, so I'm probably going to start down here just to so I can get get going. So let me just position that and set off and make sure that I'm feeding this through. Now this is going to take a long time, so I'm certainly not videoing all of this, but you get the idea. I'll come back when I've done it. So here we are, all done. So that green edge I think sets it off quite nicely. One thing I should have mentioned earlier actually is uh, be careful when you bead, make sure that your beads aren't too close to the edge because they may interfere with your foot and that's why I had a slight wobble on mine there. So just be careful of that. But yeah, it does take a bit of time and if you're like me not used to doing very much conventional sewing, waiting for the material to pass through the foot can be quite tedious but you have to be patient so that you get that lovely edge. You want that to be nicely covered so that works. But there we are. There's your finished postcard and over on the back it's all ready to be written. So you can write on that, stick a stamp on it, 
and see see what happens. If you feel a little bit more precious about it, then you can pop it in one of those clear cello bags. But there we are. There's your greetings from the garden postcard. If you like what you've seen today, please give us a thumbs up and write any comments below and I'll get back to you. And please subscribe and I'll look forward to seeing you again.